All right. Some of you are familiar with the agnostic British philosopher Bertrand Russell. In 1967, he wrote this. There is one serious defect in my mind in Christ's moral character. Now, there's a bold statement, right? There is this one serious defect in my mind in the moral character of Jesus. He said, and that is that he believed in hell. Uh, I'm grateful that Dr. Uh, Russell did acknowledge that Jesus believed in hell. Some people deny that. Uh, his views are a little bit more consistent than religious philosopher and a religious philosopher, John Hick, who referred to hell as a grim fantasy that's not only, quote, morally revolting, but also, quote, a serious perversion of the Christian gospel. So the doctrine of hell is taught in the Scriptures, Old and New Testament, is a perversion of the Christian gospel, according to him. Worse yet, a theologian Clark Pinnock, who uh, at one point, uh, at least, described himself as an evangelical, which uh, often we say, oh, evangelical, that's a good thing. Well, uh, people self-identify as a lot of different things that aren't really true before God. So, he said, as he dismissed hell, how can anyone imagine for a moment that the God who gave his son to die for sinners because of his great love for them would install a torture chamber somewhere in the new creation in order to subject those who reject him to everlasting pain? Now, I have you know, a few minutes here with you this morning to talk about a really complicated story and a big, sweeping biblical doctrine. And a lot of the things we've talked about this summer are, are biblical doctrinal issues that if, if you don't get these, a lot of what is a true faith in God, what is a biblical worldview, start to unravel. And we've, so we've talked about grace last week, and it's so closely tied to this topic. And this is one that's so under attack that we felt like we really needed to spend a week talking about this. Now, I have preached about hell multiple times over, over the years that I have been here, and I've talked about different things. And We don't have time to talk about all the different words the Bible uses for hell today. We don't have time to, to uh, talk about what the whole Bible says about hell or what the original languages point to in relationship to hell, but the Bible clearly teaches this. There is life after death. And that life after death will either be an eternal life of joy or torment. It will involve either enjoying the glorious, loving presence of God for all eternity, or it will be facing the wrathful presence of God for all eternity. It is, it is taught in the Old Testament. Like most biblical doctrines, it comes to its full form, its complete form in the New Testament. Those who wrote the scriptures, inspired by the Holy Spirit, believed that hell existed and they made it as plain as they could make it as they wrote. Is the doctrine of hell compatible with the way of Jesus Christ? And a lot of people say, no, it's incompatible. Well, the most prolific teacher on hell in the Bible is Jesus yeah, he talked about it more than anybody else. Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. And he makes it very clear. And so Matthew 25, 41 through 46, he teaches at least four truths about hell that should cause us to grieve over the prospect of anybody that we care about and love from ourselves to somebody else ever spending eternity there. Uh, now, here's, here's what we come back to when we talk about this particular doctrine. And it is... We make stuff up and we call it from God. Uh, this particular doctrine is denied by almost every Christian denomination in the United States. They abandoned this a long time ago. Because it is the first doctrine that tends to fall by the wayside when a person or a group of people decide, I don't think the Bible is the authority. I think I can make this up. I think that my faith is whatever I want it to be. And God should be happy that I offer him something. And so I'm going to make this up out of my own head, which is idolatry. I'm going to make up a God, make up a religion, make up a salvation plan, and I expect that God's going to honor it. And that's just not so. 
But this is the first one to typically drop because it is the hardest one. I'm telling you, if, if, if there's anything that probably all of us would say, I wouldn't mind if this one went away, it'd be a doctrine of hell. But it is there and it is core to the gospel itself. So we're going to talk about that today. Here we go. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Jesus teaching his disciples. He said, then... He will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or in prison or sick uh, and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Hell is a real place in the Bible. It's mentioned 23 times. 15 of those 23 come from uh, Jesus himself. Jesus calls it a place of torment in Luke 16. Hell is real, and that's in spite of its unpopularity today. Uh, The most recent study I could come across a few years ago in relationship to Americans' view of hell is a belief that there is such a place as a hell, which was running 15 years ago, somewhere around the 35 percentile, is now well below a fourth of the population that even believe there is such a place. And that includes people who are regular churchgoers. That's not just... People who don't go to church. It's people who go to church, people who don't go to church, people who are affiliated with a religious system of some sort. They're going to deny that hell exists. A large and growing percentage of Christians have abandoned the teachings of their faith groups. Most Americans don't expect to uh, experience hell firsthand. Uh, This survey found that they did did find a few people who said, yeah, I expect I'm going to go to hell. One half of 1% said that, and actually they're probably... Uh, atheist uh, agnostics at best who, who really uh, just yank in the chain of uh, pollsters calling them on the phone late at night. Hell is real. God's word often describes hell as fire, like uh, a lot of places. Jesus said, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That from Matthew 13. In Jude 7, it calls hell the punishment of eternal fire. Hell is the lake of fire in Revelation 20. So there, are things, there are things we know about hell. And this is how I want to go at this this morning. There are things we know about hell. And there are a lot of things we think we know about hell. And so I want to start out with the things we think we know about hell. And these are myths about heaven. So there's a spot in your outline today to note some of these things. Here's the first myth about heaven. People say hell is the place where where Satan reigns. And that's a myth. Many people think of it as the place where the devil reigns. It is viewed as his home. It's viewed as his castle. It's viewed like his fiery bat cave where he plots the demise of the world uh, as an evil villain where he tries to destroy the church, rule the world. Uh, if, if, it, if it's not seen as like a, the devil's war room, then it's seen as uh, the place where he torments people who've been sent there. Like he's walking around with his pitchfork poking folks that are there, the... Uh, picture a far side cartoon far side did just hundreds of cartoons with that kind of uh, image in it that's how people think about this place but hell is not the devil's castle he occupies no position of authority in hell according to the bible hell is the devil's ruin it is his future it is, is his everlasting prison it is his dungeon it is his fate He's not in charge of anything there. He's just one of the occupants, as the Bible tells the story. Now, I think one of the reasons people hold on to that idea that the devil is ruling in hell is because if you can think of him as, and by the way, the Bible does teach this too. We've spent some Sundays on this in the past on our doctrinal position. 
a, a being, an entity that is Satan, Hasatan, the adversary, uh, exists. The Bible's really clear on that. Also quickly denied by people who stopped believing the Bible a long time ago. People who hold on to the idea that devil's ruling in hell, the reason they do it is because if he's in hell, he isn't near me. And he isn't near mine. And he's not getting into my business. And people like that idea. It removes him from any place of influence or danger in my existence. So if he is there, he's not here. So we don't have to give him much thought. But the devil is here. He is alive and well on planet earth. And he is, he is working hard. And he's trying to drag as many people to his ultimate fate with him as he can. He is a real and present danger. Peter says, uh, the devil prowls around. He's prowling through our families. He's prowling through our cities and our suburbs and our countryside. Seeking people to devour like a lion uh, uh, chasing after his prey. He, wants to do, he is the Apollyon. He is the destroyer. He wants to wreck you, wreck your life here, and take you with him to hell forever. In all of this, our gospel hope and our gospel confidence is that the good old devil has been cast down. He's already been defeated at the cross and at the resurrection He's been bound through the ministry of Jesus, destroyed by Christ's work at the cross, and the church has been set free from bondage, from deceit, from the power of sin, and we will trample the deceiver underfoot. He has been beaten. He's just awaiting his final judgment. Hell is not where he reigns. Hell is his end game. Second myth. You hear this a lot. You hear it in songs. And man, it goes from the country songs to the hard rock songs, everything in between. Uh, hell is where sinners go to party. Hell is this big party. And, and, and many of you said, well, let me pull out my iPod and uh, run a couple things on my playlist there and see what's happening. I've heard this myth quite a bit, and that's why I want to talk about it. It's when discussing salvation, salvation from sin and death and hell with people that are outside God's kingdom, you'll hear this, you know, I'd, I'd rather party with my friends in hell than be with a bunch of uptight, white robe wearing religious people in heaven. Now, I don't believe that that reflects really anyone's real theology about heaven or hell. They probably figure that everybody's going to heaven and they'll They'll self-define how they get to heaven and they'll self-define what heaven's going to be like instead of what God says it's going to be like. But it reveals a lot about themselves and reveals how they view themselves, how they view religious people, and that's more of what that statement is about. It's a way, of, though, of dismissing the promises and dismissing the claims of Jesus Christ. And it denies Scripture. So that's a key part of this particular uh, myth. It denies what the Bible says. So that's why I want to deal with it. Hell in the Bible is not a dark, comfortable bar where you hang out with friends and you tell stories about what you did in high school and all the fun times you've had and discuss philosophy of life. Uh, hell is not some kind of everlasting party with a devilish house band and lit glow sticks. Hell is no party. Hell in the Bible, it's not what you make it. You don't define what hell is. God defines what hell is. And it is dark and endless and joyless, and it's a place of judgment. That's what hell is like. Scripture tells us that it is appointed for us all to die, and after that we face judgment. As sinners, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. We've broken God's law, and we can expect that God's going to judge us. He'll find us guilty, and he will send us to the place of outer darkness, as Jesus describes it. And, and our hope is not found in trying to persuade the righteous judge that we're better than most or that we've done some good stuff or that he'll just give us a pass. There is no probation in hell. There is no work release program. Our only hope, and thank God it has been provided by a loving God, our only hope is faith in Jesus Christ who gave himself for us the cross and was raised from the dead. Savior, he's the only one that provides forgiveness of sin, the righteousness that we lack, 
in the hope of eternal life in heaven. Through faith in him. Because of the grace that God offers us in Christ. Myth number three. That hell is temporary. Now this is also popular. Among those who take hell at least a bit more seriously. We sometimes find the myth that hell is temporary. Temporal. Not everlasting. And the reason is often that. You say well hell, hell is punishment for a lifetime of maybe several decades, but how does eternal punishment, how does, how does that measure out as just before God? And so a lot of people will just reject it because it doesn't make sense in their head. It doesn't seem fair, which is, by the way, the whole thing of shaking your fist in the face of God and saying what God says isn't true. So the idea is, after some degree of punishment has been met, God says, okay, I burned the sin out of you, and so now you're all good, and you can come on to heaven, or uh, annihilation. You cease to exist. And so those two myths continue to uh, exist out there. But, and to do that, you have to deny the Word of God. Scripture is clear on the everlasting nature of hell. It's a place of eternal destruction, eternal punishment, eternal fire. And there's no hope of probation in hell. We are created as immortal beings, the Bible teaches, and we will go on living after death. It will either go on living in the presence of God and His grace or experiencing His just and righteous judgment. Here, here's the part that we miss about the eternity of hell. You don't stop sinning in hell. You don't repent in hell. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a moment, give you a good biblical example uh, that we have a snapshot of what hell is like. The, the reason you continue to be judged is because you continue in sin. Hell is everlasting judgment. Our only hope of escaping that curse, trusting in the one who became curse for us, Jesus Christ. He took the sins of the world upon himself, died to pay for that sin, and offers us forgiveness to set us free from condemnation and set us free to experience eternal life. That's the gift of God through Jesus Christ, His Son. Do you see that we keep going back to that story? This is not God being vengeful and hateful and mean-spirited. He's given you every out. He's given everybody every opportunity. It's just a matter of, will you accept the grace of God? Fourth myth is that hell is for bad people. Now, this is one of the most dangerous myths about hell. Hell is for bad people. And this is a tricky one because it depends on what you mean by bad people, right? In my experience, when someone says, hell is for bad people, I said, who are you talking about? I'm talking about somebody besides me. I'm talking about you. Huh? I'm, all, I'm not one of the bad people. You're one of the bad people. Or there, there's some sort of measure that, well, I'm not as bad as a lot of people, so I'm, I'm going to grade out. I'm going to beat the curve. I, I'm going to make it. Surely someone's done worse than me. Now, people who will say, I don't believe in hell, you can often ask them, well, so you think Hitler, Stalin, Bin Laden, you think uh, these mass murderers, do you think they should be in hell? Oh, okay, I do believe in hell for them. Most everybody believes in hell as long as it's for those really, really bad people. But not for us regular uh, garden variety sinners. The one point of agreement we should have with this myth is that hell is for bad people. But this is the part that circles back on us. We are the bad people. All of sin to come short of the glory of God. And our sin to... Uh, well, Jesus said no one's good but God. Apostle Paul wrote, no one is righteous. All have turned away from God and become worthless. So we're all bad, worthy of eternal condemnation. Now you look at this and say, well, look at this. Look at this list of all these horrible things this particular person has done. Well, we'd say, well, yeah, they got a longer list than a lot of people. Yeah, that's a pretty bad woman. Or here's this man, and he's done something that's just more repulsive to me personally. His sin just seems a lot worse than my sin because of the nature of what his sin is. And yeah, that, that would certainly be the case. But we are all equally sinners. We are all equally desperately in need of the grace of God. Hell is for bad people. If by bad people, we're all going to mean people like us. That's who uh, 
That's who hell's for. Our hope. And this is the part where two sermons about grace are going to kick in. Our hope is not that we'll become good people and then we'll get to go to heaven and we'll overcome our bad. Our hope is not that we become better people, better than the people around us, better than most folks, and then we'll get to go to heaven and we can avoid hell. That's not our hope. Our hope and our confidence before God is the gospel. It is the good news of Jesus Christ, that everyone who believes in Jesus Christ is united with Him, counted righteous in Him, forgiven through Him of all sin. So in one sense, hell is for bad people. In another sense, heaven is for bad people. But here's the difference. Hell is for those who have rejected the truth of God. And heaven is for those who have received Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. Bad people are going to go to hell. Bad people are going to go to heaven. But when you give your life to Jesus, all God sees is Jesus. Now, in our verses today, there's just a few things I want to touch on. And I've already touched a little bit on them already and going through our myths. But here's some things that are clear about hell. Hell is a state of separation from God. On the day of judgment, Jesus will say to all the unbelievers, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, verse 41. This is the same sort of language Jesus uses elsewhere to describe the final judgment of unbelievers. He did it back in chapter 7 of Matthew. To be separated from God is to be separated from anything that is good. And it is hard for us to conceive. Even, Even the most miserable of people enjoys a lot of the goodness and the grace of God. Uh, any of you get a good rain this week? Yeah. Did it rain on your neighbor's yard that didn't deserve it? You, can't, you got up and came to church today. Your neighbor, they're sitting at home, terrible pagans that they are. It rained on their yard too. That's what the Bible says. The rain falls on the good and the bad. That all of us are recipients of, of the, that general grace of God. We breathe His air, we eat His food, we enjoy a lot of the blessings of living in God's universe, that common grace of God. On earth, uh, even the most devout of atheists enjoy the benefits of God's goodness. Here's the difference. In hell, those blessings will be non-existent. Those condemned to hell will remember, uh, remember the goodness of God. We'll even have some awareness of the unending pleasures of heaven. You have that story, and that's most of the time when I preached about heaven and hell, uh, often as a combination sermon, uh, I've, I've used that story of the rich man and Lazarus, poor Lazarus. Just a poor man, a beggar, he had nothing in this life but a relationship to God. The rich man, he had everything except a relationship to God. And they both die Poor man Lazarus, he's a, he is celebrating all things heaven. And the, the rich man is in hell, but he can see into heaven. And he sees what he's missing. And he sees what could have been. And it is, his heart is filled with regret. And I'm going to spend some more time with him later on in the message. But we see, he sees it, but he has no access to it. Now, This does not mean that God is completely absent in hell. Because God is omnipresent. Psalm 139 is going to tell us. He is uh, not confined and not uh, prevented from any place. To be separated from the Lord and cast into hell does not mean you're finally free of God. You remain eternally, eternally accountable to God. He's Lord wherever your eternity is spent. But in hell, a person will be forever separated from God in his kindness, in his goodness, in his mercy, in his grace. And still deal with God, still interact with God, but only in his judgment. Second thing, hell is a state of association. Jesus says, the eternal fire of hell was prepared for the devil And his angels, uh, verse 41. You know, you're made in the image of God. You're created. We're all created to know God and love God and serve God. You were made for God. 
Hell was made for the devil and his angels. Uh, in uh, John 14, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. He's talking about heaven. And he said, heaven, heaven's just where you feel at home. When you walk through the gates of glory, you feel like this is, what, this is where I was supposed to be. This is what I was made for. This is where I, this is where I feel most at home. And when someone goes to spend eternity in hell, they say, this is so foreign and so other than and so desperately twisted from what fits me and, and, and should be for me. Now, many who don't believe in the devil in this life will end up spending eternity tormented with him in hell. To be with him, because he's not in charge, he's just one of you. Hell is a state of association. And you just, I think that maybe, maybe, uh, maybe that's the song you sing for all eternity then. As we sing it about this world in all its sinfulness and brokenness. Maybe if you're going to sing a song in hell, it's going to be, this is not where I belong. This is not what I was created for. This is not what I ever intended. This is not where I want to be. And yet, for all eternity. Hell is a state of punishment. Third, Jesus describes it as fire. A place of punishment in verse 46. Uh, verse 41, uh, fire. Hell is a place of, of retribution. And it's a place of justice. It's a place where you serve uh, payment for crimes committed. The punishment must fit the crime. The misery and the torment of hell point to the wickedness and the seriousness of sin. You know, those, who, uh, those who say the whole doctrine of hell or certainly an eternal hell, that, that's too excessive. Uh, what, what they are saying is, Sin isn't that bad. Sinfulness isn't quite so sinful. Uh, we minimize sin. We maximize our goodness when we deny the glory of God in such statements. For sinners to be consigned to anything less than the horrors of eternal punishment would be a miscarriage of justice. I'll talk more about why that would be so. Because hell is an everlasting state. Everlasting state. Some would like to shorten the duration of this state. Jesus' words are clear. He uses the same adjective to describe both punishment and life in verse 46. And he uses eternal for both. The exact same word. And this isn't the only place where that happens. If hell is not eternal, then neither is heaven. Jesus is spelled out clearly, concisely. Just in this passage. But the same term describes heaven as everlasting. And applied to hell as everlasting. In Matthew 18, Matthew 19, Mark 3, Mark 9, Mark 10, Luke 18, Jude 7. And Revelation 20 talk about eternal judgment. Instead of using the word hell, just say judgment. How, how can God exact infinite punishment for finite sin? And that's a big question that uh, we stumble over. How can, you, how can you be punished forever for sin that was during a con confined lifetime? Well, first, because the person against whom all sin is committed is infinite. Why does it deserve an infinite punishment? Because a God who is infinitely good, infinitely holy, infinitely pure, infinitely glorious... The sin is against him. And because it is against him, it deserves an infinitely harsh punishment to be exacted. Same idea as how could Jesus suffering on a cross for six hours run Friday pay for the sins of the whole world for all time for eternity? Jesus suffered terribly at the cross but a lot of people have suffered terribly physically in this world. 
and for longer periods of time. So how did Jesus, suffering for six hours one Friday, pay for the sins of the whole world forever and ever? Because, not because of the degree of his suffering, but because of where he came from. He came from the glory of heaven to this sinful earth. And that distance and what he experienced... That's what made it sufficient to pay for all sin, for all time, and eternal life for those who place their faith in Him. So, here's the other part. Those condemned to hell, and I I talked about this earlier, will go on sinning for all eternity. There's no repentance in hell, so the punishment will continue because the sinning continues. I'll give you an example. Back to our poor man in Lazarus. Do you remember what the, uh, Lazarus, the poor man, and the rich man? Remember what the rich man said? He sees into heaven and he says, God, I repent of my sin. My whole life was wrong. I have failed you and I have failed my fellow man and I'm a terrible, terrible sinner. That's not what he says. What the rich man says is, have mercy on me. I'm, I'm parched. I'm, it's miserable. I'm in torment. So here's what, God, here's what I need you to do. I need you to send that poor man, because, you know, he should still be working for me at some capacity. Send that poor man to come down here and help me out with my problem. Oh, also, my brothers, they're not believers. I don't want them to be here. So, God, here's how you need to do that, too. And you know how God concludes that story? You don't know what you're talking about. The person in hell continues in a state of rebellion against God, unrepenting, still blaming God for every problem, questioning God's every bit of wisdom, constant. constant. It never changes. And that's why hell is eternal. Because, Because sin continues, so does the punishment. Two key things. The dreadfulness of hell deepens our grateful praise for salvation. When I, I, receive, I receive no joy from talking about any of this today, I tell you. You know why? Because I know people who are in hell. There, there are people I sought to, I sought to share with who, who didn't accept Christ. There are people that, that I got a little ways into the conversation, but I, you know, I wish I had those conversations back to, to say something different, to say something else. I don't get any joy out of thinking anybody is in hell. One of the things that I do receive whenever I read the, the harsh things the Bible says about hell is I have a sense of, of overflowing gratitude for the grace of God, recognizing I do not deserve forgiveness of sin, going through life and a relationship to God and having assurance of eternity in heaven because of what Jesus did for me at the cross. It just makes me really, really grateful. For all God has done for me. And that's a big part of this doctrine of hell in the Bible. The second thing is believing the truth about hell most certainly should motivate us to persuade people to be reconciled to God. By God's grace, those of us who are trusting Christ have been rescued from this horrible destiny. How can we say we love people and refuse to speak plainly to them about the realities of eternal damnation and God's gracious provision of salvation. When uh, we're in Tanzania, and I've had this conversation before, uh, Kathy Gibson was with me. We, we got to one of our very last visits. And I, just, I just said, I'm, I'm begging you. After he, he had rejected everything we threw his way, I am begging you. Give your life to Jesus. Don't walk away from this opportunity. Uh, you know, I, 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 came, I came halfway around the world for a divine appointment with you today to tell you this story. Surely you can see God's at work in this. Give your life to Jesus Christ. And I played every card I could play. And he still rejected Christ. But it wasn't, wasn't because... Uh, because a group of believers in a dusty back alley of a village in Tanzania didn't, didn't say and try and pray and do everything we could to make it different. 
Clear visions of hell give us greater love for God and greater love for people. I can't deny hell without completely changing the gospel message. The message of Christ dying for the lost to save their souls is meaningless when you take away the doctrine of hell. One pastor said, to appreciate justly and fully the gospel of eternal salvation, we must believe in the doctrine of eternal damnation. The idea is, if I'm going to deny eternal damnation, I have to rewrite the whole gospel. Again, I've rejected the scriptures. I've rejected God's own revelation of himself and of truth, and I've started making stuff up. And that's what a cult is. That's what idolatry is. I've committed treason against God. And it calls for God's just wrath. And when we take that part out of the equation, we've rewritten the gospel. There, there are a lot of gospels out there. There are a lot of folks coming up with a lot of different teachings. But, but what is clear is, is this gospel in God's book declares this, I'll give you a good theological term, the substitutionary atonement of Christ. That he paid for our sin. That he died in our place. That he took our punishment for sin for us. When you give up hell, you've also denied this core core doctrine of scripture. This gospel stands and falls on the existence of heaven and of hell. And you take either one away and you gut the gospel. And it becomes meaningless. If I'm going to give up hell, then I've given up a biblical gospel and I've replaced it with a new one. And I'm telling you, you, then you're just making stuff up. And I challenge you to challenge everybody who comes and says, and this is true really over a lot of what uh, Jimmy and I have talked about in this summer series, is when someone says, well, here's what I believe, they better have a scripture to go with it. Or they're just making stuff up. And challenge people on that. Don't let them get away with it. Well, see, in my way of thinking, this is how God does it. You're just making stuff up. And when you just make stuff up, you have no authority for it. You know, a background for it. You have no foundation upon which to build. It's false teaching. Let me close this word. And I appreciated this. And I found this quote from a theologian that I believe it as well. He said, Sure I am that if hell may be disproved in any way that's solid and true, consistent with God's honor and man's good, there's not a trembling sinner in this land that would hail the demonstration with more joy than I would. There was any way to get rid of this one. Any way to dispense with the doctrine of hell. Any way that made sense, that was biblical, that honored God, that was for our good. I would absolutely embrace it. It's not that I want hell to be true but that God's word makes it clear that it is true. And it's not for me to dismantle the doctrine. It's not for me to deny the doctrine. My responsibility before God is to believe it and to live and act upon it as true. If you have never given your life to Jesus Christ... And I'm not talking about, oh yeah, I believe in God. Oh yeah, I was baptized. I was confirmed. I've gone to church for a long time. Let me tell you all the good things I've done, how I'm better than most people I know or most people in this room maybe. I'm not talking about that. Hell's going to be full of people with a great resume of good deeds. Hell's going to be full of people who had a wonderful attendance record at church. Hell's going to be full of people who've splashed around in a baptistry somewhere. It's, have you ever given your life to Jesus Christ? And... And, and I've spent so much time thinking about hell in the last week as I prepared for today. I'm t- I am begging you. Don't say, no, I think I'm okay. I'm pretty sure it's going to work out. Like my guy in Tanzania. He just said, I think I'm okay. I don't think I need that. I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Trust Him as your Savior and Lord. As your only Savior and Lord. Yield your life to Him. More than a religious game. More than, more than a check in 
religious activity boxes on some kind of score pad that you've created in your mind. But give your life to Jesus Christ. 